right, everyone, and welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf. It's great to have the Hall of Famer Chris Carter back with us today. This is Nick Wright. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Very good. Good morning. Doing great. Today's the open of two, two awesome sporting exactly. events. Exactly. Both on this network and Big Fox. We are at the start of the U.S. Open, where we're watching Tiger Woods and the start of World Cup action. Yes. 2018. Very excited about that. A so lot of exciting of stuff it. happening. Cannot. All right, but let us start with the aforementioned U.S. Open, the 118th U.S. Open, teeing off from Shinnecock Hills. All eyes on Tiger Woods. Yes, Tiger is aiming for his 15th major. Yes, it would be his first since his iconic victory in the 2008 U.S. Open, but he's also just trying to put all parts of his game together as his comeback tour continues from four back surgeries. He hasn't had a win yet this one, would be a doozy. Tiger tees off at 1.47 p.m. today. CC, what does Tiger Woods have to do to consider round one a success? To go out there, start strong, and finish the round strong? Well, first, as a golf fan, you have to adjust your eye and adjust what you think of what is a good round of golf when you have the U.S. Open compared to the other three majors. It's the hardest test in golf. The United States Golf Association, they make it that way. And also, we should know that last year's winner, Brooks Kepka, he shot a record 16 under. So typically, when they go that far under par, the USGA comes back, and they typically take it out on the golfers the next year. So I expect the scores to be compared to low. I expect them to be high. Any score under par would be a great score. And what Tiger has to really be concerned about can he keep the ball in the fairway because of the penalties with the rough and the fescue that they have at Shinnecock? And he can't lose contact with the field. And that's what we've seen with Tiger on the first round and the second round. He's lost contact with the field. You have to, especially in this U.S. Open, he's got to get off to a good start, which I believe will breed confidence for an amazing weekend. And a good start, to your point, would be even through nine. Right? Like that, it's not the, we, we, when we've discussed Tiger in tournaments before, you've said, listen, there's going to be someone that posts a seven under after the first round. So if you're not at three or four under, you've already lost contact. For Tiger, it's not making big mistakes early. You've said that every golf tournament he's ever played, He's been nervous on his first drive of the tournament, which I think people would find remarkable. That's from talking to him, talking to his late father. Yes. And you see it. like The adrenaline and the excitement of it. He's just very, very normal when he starts, which was shocking um, for me to hear for someone who's been as great as long as he has. And so, uh, to me, the... I think we can anticipate that if Tiger's in contention, that if Tiger has not only a good opening round, but second, third, and fourth round, and by the way, just making the weekend, it would be the first time since, what, 2013 that he made the weekend at the U.S. Open. If those things happen, he, we know he's going to be great from the fairway to the green. In order for him to win, how is he going to be driving the ball? How is he going to be putting the ball? Because this year he's been one of the best players on tour with his irons, with his chipping around the green. Mm -hmm. The putting has, has been hot and cold. The driving's been colder earlier, hotter of late, but he hasn't put that all together. So that in a tournament like this where we know the greens are going to be very difficult and we know that while the fairways are wider than they've been in the past, that if you get out into the rough, you're in really rough shape. Those to me would be the keys for him. Is that why you called it the hardest tournament in golf? That's what the USAGA, they call it. And they're in pursuit to find who are the best golfers. Now, in Tiger, the first part of his career compared to the comeback, I would say there was less golfers capable of being able to handle the fire of Tiger. Now with a lot of these young guns, they haven't played against Tiger in battle, so they don't necessarily have the fear and intimidation. That's why it's important that Tiger stays connected to the pack compared to in a USGA tournament like this. You're not going to be able to make a lot of birdies. So if you get four, five shots behind, man, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be, uh, you can cancel the, the chance of winning. You brought up the comeback. Do you think Tiger has to win this tournament to complete? this comeback I think Tiger has I don't think Tiger will the comeback is complete until he wins a major like that's to me how I think he's measuring it I know there that might be skipping a step you might say we'll win a regular tournament first well they, there are no more regular tournaments before the next major because the next major starts today Tiger I I, I I'm not sure how many people know off the top of their head how many tournaments Tiger has won. But almost all golf fans know he's got 14 majors. His goal was to pass 18 majors. That's what Tiger said he's always measured himself by, not how many Player of the Year awards. Like, the example I'll use is in 20. 
2015, he was player of the year. He won five times. And we didn't think he was back yet because why? He didn't win a major. Like, for me to consider the comeback complete, that will be when he wins a major. And, Nick, you're like a lot of people. Your expectations of Tiger Woods, they're just unrealistic. Like, you can't say that if he only wins a major, which he's only won 14, 14 of those, that a comeback is complete. The guy is the only guy in the history of the PGA Tour that's played golf with a fused back. He's leading the tour right now as far as striking the ball and greens and stuff. Like, the key thing, his comeback is already complete. It doesn't have to be justified by a win. He never thought he was going to play golf again. He was concerned about walking again. So now we're talking about Tiger has a chance in a major. Like, listen, I mean, his career, we were looking at, man, is Tiger Woods going to ever play golf? So now he had a surgery that no other golfer has successfully played on tour with. And now, oh, no, hitting the golf ball is not good enough now. So now he's got to win a major. No, he's only won three U.S. Opens. This has been the hardest tournament of any tournament he's ever been in to win. That's why he's only won three. Let me, let me ask you this. Maybe we can meet in the middle here. What if I would say the comeback has already been a success? Because he's playing, because he's competing at a high level, because he seems healthy. Because he's that, been in contention for a couple of so, so the comeback, given where he came from, given the fuse back, the fact that he was worried about being able to play with his kids long into his life, much less golf, it's already been a successful comeback. But for it to be a completed comeback, he's got to do what he is out there trying to do. That doesn't mean this weekend. But for me to feel like the, the Tigers back that we talk about, isn't that about winning majors? Well, Nick, you can put it in any category you want to, all right? I've traveled around the country watching Tiger Woods. I know Tiger is really satisfied. Now, he's also a great athlete. Once you accomplish something, you begin to change your goals. But for us to say we knew he would be playing, like we knew he'd be striking the ball this well no. at Muirfield, oh, he's going to hit the ball with his irons as good as anyone in the world? No, those aren't things that we would think. But, Jenna, you pointed out in this Tiger comeback, you've noted a few things that are very, very different. has nothing to do with the golf. Tiger's won because of his personality. He's far more embracing the spotlight. He's far more approachable. When you watch the press conferences, Tiger will tell you, it's already been successful. So for me, I know Tiger Woods has set high goals, but I don't believe it's, it's really fair for a person that has a fused lower back. No one in the history of the sport's ever done it. Right. And now he's got to win a U.S. Open to complete the comeback. No, I'm not going to be on that side. So I'm going to echo that and just say coming into this tournament, if we've been listening to some of the things he's been talking about, it's this overwhelming optimism that you're hearing from him that, you know, I've really spent the last couple of weeks, months, working on all facets of my game. Now I feel like I'm going to put it all together. I feel really good about coming into this. Maybe winning the tournament wouldn't be a success, but would you say making the cut? Would you say within the top ten? Is there is there some place where you can put him where you'd say, you know what, I think this, is, this would be a, a remarkable achievement for him. The, the problem with Tiger is Tiger started adjusting his goals. First he wanted to get back out on tour. Now, of course, Tiger, he thinks he can win. Oh. He thinks he can win this weekend. Absolutely. And him being in the tournament's a great accomplishment, but – how he, how he strikes the ball and playing uh, with Justin Thomas and um, Dustin Johnson, yeah. number one and two in the world. Like, no, he's expecting to be able to match them shot for shot. So in that, I got to take a Tiger mentality. He wants to definitely finish in the top ten. The number one thing is to make the cut. Okay. All right, make the cut and then finish in the top ten. But give him chance, give himself a chance on Sunday, gentlemen. And people should know, like, he has not finished. He, he, wanted, he, he was se second in 07. He won at no eight. Yep. He then was sixth in 09, fourth in 2010. Since then, he's only made the cut twice. He's only played in the thing three times, and he doesn't have a single top 20. Like so, anything past the weekend or into the weekend, pardon me, would be the first time in five years. A top 10 would be the first one in eight years. And the reason why I'm optimistic is because this year Tiger, he changed all of his irons. In the last couple of weeks, he changed his wedges. So he's gone through a whole bag change for the most part, and he's striking the ball very well. Tiger Woods is the greatest putter that's ever putted on a golf course. So I believe the putting will come back to him. That's the reason why I'm optimistic. All right, Tiger Woods tees off at 147 today, looking for his 15th major. We'll get much more on this coming up. On the other side, some basketball. Now, what did Paul George say about his future with LeBron James? Hear it from him next on First Things First.
All right, we're going to get to what Paul George and LeBron are discussing in a second, but first, D-back. We still are doing butt first, Jenna? Yeah, yeah, we are. Oh, okay. so, how many times are we doing it, Nick? Three okay. times All a day. Right. Same All time right. every day. But this one's new because I haven't seen it yet. Dave Peralta with the deep shot to left ball, bouncing off oh. the glove of Austin Meadows. Score this an assisted home run. Man, this isn't as bad as the one of these that sent Florida to the so College the World Series. There's no comparison to these two, though, Nick. That guy's a professional. The oh, kids in college, they own scholarship. Uh, agreed. But this was an easy fly ball right here. Oh, here you go. Okay. All right, check this out. Trick oh. shot expert Jaden Zabu goes through the legs, behind the back, improbable basket. And how does he celebrate? How does he celebrate? Uh, uh, oh, uh, CeCe's uh, dance. Uh, uh, uh. The back, back kid. Oh, come on, man. That, that's so corny. Listen, I'm tired of these old trick shot artists because I've seen some of those guys try to make it in the NFL. And you know what? It's a trick for them to throw it straight. Wait, check this out. <laughs> oh. You saw this guy yesterday. No, that this was is nice. Guy Dupuis over the riding bicyclist. Le bicyclette. All right, yesterday he, he jumped over three guys, went behind the back. Now he does the East Bay funk off the alley over the bicyclist. You got to be real. I think brave this happened in the, the Philippines. I think it's a three on three tournament going on in the Philippines where this guy's doing it. This guy's this a is, bike's like. Look at yeah. him. A bicyclist wearing a helmet, though. Didn't have full yeah, he's confidence in guy something on his head. He ducked. He was Next smart. Next going to get snapped back. <laughs> Hey, just because the NBA season is over doesn't mean the NBA scuttlebutt is among the many issues to be discussed. LeBron James and the third big decision of his career. Is it just about him? Are other players a factor? Paul George, for example, is his future tied into LeBron's? And could they be a package deal somewhere? Paul George can't seem to avoid questions about it. Would you like to be on the same team as LeBron? Yeah, I'm with LeBron every All-Star. Yeah, no, but like, you know. Every one of my All-Stars, I've been teamed with LeBron. And you guys seem to work well together, right? You guys play well together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got a losing record, but I love, I like playing with him. You love playing with him? Yeah, it was fun playing with LeBron All-Star weekend. So have, have you made up your mind of where you want to play next? In the NBA. But you like the Lakers. You like L.A. You can see your hate. We're in L.A. now. We're in L.A. I'm from L.A. You're so from that, LA. that I can, I can say I love L.A. because I'm from L.A. All right, so in the last couple of days, the Lakers, Los Angeles, has jumped to the forefront for the most part of where LeBron is going to end up next year. It wouldn't just be LeBron. We talk about it, LeBron plus someone else. If it was just LeBron, Nick, plus Paul George, would that be enough to make the Lakers title contenders, or would they need more? So I've evolved on this point because two months ago I'd have said no. Two months ago, I would have said it's one of the reasons LeBron shouldn't go to L.A. unless it's him plus two other guys when there was discussions, maybe Kawhi getting traded there, maybe Boogie going along with Paul George and LeBron. And so, but all of a sudden, the Lakers are not only they're not even money, they're now a minus favorite to get LeBron James. And talking to people, it seems like there is real belief that not only are they a contender, they might right now truly be the leading contender. And so you weigh that, and you also weigh what we just saw over the last two months of the NBA playoffs. Were the Cavs a title contender? We would, it wouldn't have thought it going into the playoffs, wouldn't have thought it midway through the playoffs. And then final couple games in Boston with no all-star teammate, Kevin Love's out, wins those games. Game one does enough to win and I think everyone at this table believes had they won that game, that series is still going on. We're talking about a game six tonight. So the Cavs with a terrible roster, with no one playing at an all-star level, only two guys playing at an above-replacement level, were almost title contenders already. So would LeBron plus Paul George be title contenders? I think the answer is yes. If LeBron is maintaining the level that he played at in this postseason for yeah, the next no year, reason to think no he reason won't. he's not. LeBron plus a legitimate top 15 players that a title contender, yes. Would I call them title favorites? Absolutely not. But would they be one of three or four teams that are true contenders? Yes. They're a true title contender if they go back to the East. Okay. If LeBron talks him into coming back to the East, that has a lot to do with the East and the West. Yeah. Now, Paul George and LeBron being on the Lakers with their current roster, going what they're going to go against as far as San Antonio, what they're going to see. The Pelicans are, are for real. Utah is for real. And I haven't even gotten to the best teams in, in the Western Conference, in Houston and in Golden State. Now, him and Paul George, I believe they could potentially win a, a couple titles in the East if they were with a team in the East. But in the West, I believe that they're contenders, but they would have to get lucky 
to win one title, the Bills get through Houston and through Golden State. Like, so I don't think, yes, they're contenders no matter where LeBron goes, but he can't make it through the bracket of the Western Conference because the toughness of the first round matchup, that second round, and the conference final. So I don't, I mean, I like LeBron playing with, with Paul George, but they still need another asset. Well, the reason we're even talking about the Lakers is there are teams that, that can definitely bring LeBron in, but not that have the cap space and the room and the money to be able to pay LeBron and Paul George, Correct. where both these guys love L.A. Both these guys would want to be in L.A., so you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. Financially, they can afford them. Also, lifestyle-wise, they both seem to want to be there. Is there a team in the East that you could see that could house both these no, guys? No, but there, there's two teams in the East that have the Paul George already in place. That's got, that. If he were to execute if the Cavs were to execute a trade to Boston, which I know a lot of, there are some people in the NBA community that think that is a real possibility, and some people think it is absolutely insane that there are two teams LeBron will never go to, Golden State and Boston. So, But Boston has the infrastructure and the players in place. I believe Philly has the players in place. While Paul George right now is better than Embiid or Simmons, he's not better than the two of those players put together. And so you wouldn't need necessarily to bring Paul George along with you. Just like in Houston, you wouldn't need to bring Paul George because James Harden is already there. Chris Paul is already there. You no, know, and the reason why I brought it up because LeBron has dominated the East. Right. And we're talking about real title contenders in the East. That's the only reason why I brought Paul George there because in the West, it is a situation. That is the reason why the West. It's not that Golden State is there. It's the depth of the eight teams in the playoff it's that first round matchup it's that second round and as Houston can tell you with the best record now Houston is one of five teams that won 65 games or more that didn't win the NBA championship and that's not a list that they want it to be on so the and Houston it's interesting to me when you bring up Houston that Houston's somewhat fallen by the wayside in this discussion like that is they, in the LeBron discussion in the LeBron discussion absolutely that the that Houston is a team that we know for a matter of fact, wanted to acquire LeBron during the season if it was possible. Houston is a team that their GM is one of the most creative in, in basketball and all of sports at creating cap room, making things fit when you don't think they can fit as far as a salary cap perspective. And they are the closest, right? They're, they're a team that maybe would have be the NBA champions right now. If Chris they're Paul the closest, together. but like Jenna said, they don't have, they, they have to be real creative on the, on the salary cap. They are not just a, you know, a, a plug-and-play. Right. Oh, we can just bring LeBron here and we can take that max deal. No, they have to do a lot of manipulation. And Chris Paul has got to take some less money. So there's got to be some working out of that situation. So it, are the Lakers then the only team where LeBron would want to bring someone with him? Well, he's the that, only team realistically he could bring somebody with him. That's the thing. Doesn't it's like that the, limit? Then, then that limits a little bit. No, the other teams have some. If, he, if we San Antonio, they have Kawhi. Houston. They have a number of players. Right. Boston. We so, talked about Philadelphia. So it's not that the Lakers are the most ready to assume two superstars. And of all the teams, the Lakers need the most help. So that's the best way to look at it. Not try to look at it comparing the Lakers to every sure. other team. The other teams are already that much better than the Lakers. Let me run one thing by you. Chris Broussard floated that I thought was interesting. What, what would you think of this team as far as how it stacks up in the West? The Lakers with Paul George, LeBron, and Chris Paul. Because it, it, Chris, oh. the, the, Chris Broussard brought this up on Undisputed and The Herd this week, and I thought it was interesting, that Chris Paul and LeBron sign there as free agents. The Lakers then trade for Paul George. He opts into his deal with Oklahoma City, whether that means trading Lonzo or Brandon Ingram or whomever, what, is signing Julius Randle and trading him. What, what do you... To me, that team becomes 1A, 1B with Golden State. That team right there, if we thought Houston was 1A, 1B. Right. I'm not going to – Houston, we could never say they're 1A, 1B with Golden State because we've never seen them win. This is something me and you went through during the season. The coaches never won. The star players have never won. So I wouldn't put LeBron and Chris Paul and Paul George. The reason why, those, those two guys have never won. I can't. These guys got three championships. They've dominated the NBA the last four seasons. I'm not going to put them immediately in the conversation just because LeBron, they're on LeBron's coattail. No, Golden State is in a special, special class. And free agency, even if LeBron went to Boston, you still can't put them on the same level of Golden State. I mean, this is one of the dynasties that we're seeing, that we've seen in our lifetime. 
And if they're that, then there is no team that is on par with them, even with LeBron on paper. That point can only be proven on the court because Golden State has done it. And we got to the bottom of that one. <laughs> Woo! Uh, coming up, the Patriots almost traded one of their superstars. You will not believe who is actually on the trading block next on First. Tom Brady. Time for some stories now to start your morning. All eyes on Russia today. As here we go, the 2018 FIFA World Cup gets underway. 32 nations competing in 64 matches to determine which is the world's best. CC, I'll start with you. What are you looking for? Man, soccer, you're talking about a worldwide event? Like, we talk about, I, I call it real football. Mm -hmm. But football fans are, well, yeah, no, this is real football. They were playing it long before we were playing <laughs> yeah. American football. Right. I'm excited to see the athletes, the excitement that the fans and everything, it's so competitive. And every game, there could be an upset. So I'm looking forward to the overall competitiveness of the World Cup. And so obviously it kicks off tonight with the host country, Russia, taking on one of the best stories in Saudi Arabia. I... One interesting intrigue that happened yesterday, Spain, one of the favorites to win this thing, a team that won the World Cup recently, I think two World Cups ago, eight years ago, they fired their manager two days before the tournament opened, see how that affects them, they were the favorites to win their group, Brazil trying to come back off the humiliating loss to Germany in last World Cup, so excited. All right, the U.S. Open tees off from Shinnecock Hills. Right after we're done on FS1, Dustin Johnson is the favorite at 9-1, to one, having won last week, although no golfer has ever won an Open coming off a win the week before. CC, who are you picking in this? Man, there's a lot of guys that I really like. I mean, it's a, I believe the, the top 10 golfers right now is as strong as in recent history. I'm going with I, Jason Day. I, 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 I'm going I'm to I'm try Ooh. Jason Day. You know, he's one of the top. Golfers hits it as straight. Now, can he putt on the greens at Shinnecock? That will be the question. All right, so I, when it comes to golf tournaments, I always pick with my heart, so I always technically pick Tiger. Always. But let me give you, let me give you a name that I think to watch. How about Tony Finau? A guy that had a top 10 Masters finish despite dislocating his ankle on the par three. Second on the tour in driving. Top 20 yep. tee to green. He's been very good this year. Maybe could have done better at the Masters if he wasn't dealing with a dislocated ankle. Tony that Finau's That he an got by celebrating. Yeah, he was running. That's okay. He was a little over exuberant. Uh, yeah, not the best No, athlete. not the best athlete. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm thinking he would, he's not going to have to run at this tournament. He's just got to take it nice, leisurely stroll. All right, so the NBA now reports are surfacing. That former six Sixers GM Brian Colangelo overruled other Sixers execs with the decision to draft Mark L. Fultz number one. Other members of the brass thought Philly should look closer at Lonzo Ball or Jason Tatum. But Colangelo, well, he was set on Fultz. Nick, what do you make of the report? I make that people in the Philly organization are raising Brian Colangelo's burner Twitter accounts with anonymously leaked reports, throwing him under the bus. I got like, oh, okay, so we, this new regime's been in charge since Sam Hinkie. What's the biggest mistake they've made? Giving up an asset to trade up to number one to take Markel Fultz right now. That looks like a mistake when Jason Tatum looks like he should have been the pick. So let's just blame it all on Colangelo. <laughs> I mean, we should remind people Fultz was the consensus number one pick going into the draft. Yes, and he didn't have the injury in college that he ended up having in the pros. Now, if it was that, I could be like, oh, yeah, you, you got a point here. But it wasn't. He was the consensus best player. And if we hadn't seen Tatum in the playoffs, we wouldn't be questioning it as much. All right, to the NFL now. And Josh Gordon has high hopes for the Browns' wide receiving core. Gordon believes that he, Jarvis Landry, and Corey Coleman give the Cleveland the best receiving core in the league. What do you make of Gordon's claim, CC? I mean, they got a lot of unproven players. I mean, they did get Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry's led the NFL in targets the last four years, but he also averaged nine yards a catch. Right. If this was Danny Amendola, if this was uh, Wes Welker, if this was my boy Edelman, we'd be criticizing him. So I'm going to criticize him. The jury's still out on Jarvis Landry. How good is he, and is he worth that? I believe Josh Gordon is going to surprise a lot of people this season. I understand Josh Gordon's point, which is I think the Browns have as much potential at that 
position group as any team in the league. Yes. We've seen Josh Gordon. His A-level game is top five receiver in the league. Jarvis Landry. But you know what year that was. It was, I think, four years ago. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. I, I, no, I understand. But I understand. When Des Bryant was also <laughs> one of the best. <laughs> it's a, it's okay. A great point. It's a great point. Jarvis Landry as a number two, I think it's a nice number two. Corey Coleman, I understand his point. They're not there yet. And finally, the Jets drafted their future when they took quarterback Sam Darnold number three overall, but he might actually be their present. Darnold is competing with Josh McCown and Teddy Bridgewater this offseason, but he's already made quite the impression on Jets offensive coordinator Jeremy Bates. Bates says Darnold has handled everything thrown at him and that he could actually start week one. Chris, do you think Sam Darnold should be the Jets week one starter? I don't think he's the should be the Jets starter and after one week of, of mini camps like no rookie you can say should they be starting. There's been a lot of phenoms Jenna in shorts when they're not tackling them and it's easy for a quarterback to look good in shorts especially initially because the most important part of the game the blitz <laughs> that part that, that that's your guy I'm worried about Josh, Josh Rosen, Rosen yep. I'm worried about that I'm for all the quarterbacks I'm worried about that and when you can't put that on a quarterback's plate how he adjusts to that it's really hard to evaluate him that's why Jeremy Bates also said I'm looking forward to the preseason to see when we do have full contact how he's going to adjust but all the rookie quarterbacks that were drafted will start in their rookie year. That's the reason why they were drafted in the first round. I agree with C entirely. People should know the last first round quarterback to not start at any point in his rookie year was Aaron Rodgers a decade ago. So all these guys were drafted to start at some point this year. And also, if after a week or however long you've been there and you they spend a top five, top three pick on you, if when your coach is asked about could he be the week one starter, he okay. doesn't say, yeah, he could be, sure, he looks great, then something has gone wrong. It doesn't mean he will be. It doesn't mean he's going to take the punishment well but early on. But you, he's got to look good early. But let's go back before the draft. I had Sam Darnold as the most ready to play Right now, of all five of the quarterbacks, I felt like you could insert him on a team that was good, not on a team that's really, really bad. Now, can the Jets protect him? Can they get a couple of weapons to emerge to give him some targets that he can depend on? But this kid playing at USC in the type of offense, I thought it would transition to pro football. And even if it does transition, I mean, even if USC transitions better than any other team, just tell me a second, a brief moment about the difference in timing between playing at the top of your game in college and what it's like in the NFL. Just for people that are like, of course Sam Darnold should start. Uh, the, the guys move faster on the defensive front. So they can get to you faster than you can anticipate. Also, there's tremendous uh, mismatches from a defensive line standpoint going against especially the interior of the offensive line. The defensive tackles going against the center and guards, typically they're not great pass protectors. The next thing that they're not used to, they're not used to the tight coverage. They're used to guys getting separation and being wide open. If Sam Darnold's playing in the biggest game of his career in college, he's playing against one good corner and they might have a decent safety. In the pros, they got four or five guys can cover. In college, they call this open. That's three yards. In the pros, we call this open and that's about 12 inches. So that is, th those are two of the biggest differences. Speed and the, 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 the lack of separation on the perimeter and let me quickly let me ask you one other question also when you go to a school like USC that's got blue chip prospect after blue chip prospect Darnold's whole college career the vast majority of his games tell me if you agree he had the more talented team the vast majority of games when USC went out there they've got their offensive linemen are have more pros than the, the whoever they're playing defensive linemen their wide receivers are more talented than the other team's corners that obviously goes away entirely once you get to the NFL much less when you get to a team like the Jets that has struggled with their talent over the last few years all right let's move on to some interesting news out of New England there was a rumor last week that the Patriots had a trade for Rob Gronkowski on the table but that Tom Brady threatened to retire if it wasn't pulled Turns out it was just a rumor, but the Pats still did explore all of their options. What we did find out was that New England was calling teams about dealing Gronk three days before the NFL draft. CC, you surprised the Patriots even considered dealing Gronk? No, I, the only two people can't be traded. Kraft's not going to trade Belichick, and he's not going to trade Tom Brady. All right. No, of course not. When you start to have question marks as far as do you want to play, I mean, Gronk's the only player that's even even said anything publicly about, I don't know if I want to play there, and is still playing there. 
Right. I mean, typically, everyone else gets shit. Man, if you if you if if you even express that opinion, typically, they oblige you. They open up the door. They 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 trade you. What they do to Randy? Oh, uh, you want a contract extension? <laughs> Oh, well, that's not available. Well, let's see. I just let's broke see the NFL Minnesota record. Wants to give it to yeah, you. Yeah, I just, I just broke the NFL record. Oh, that's not available still. <laughs> so it, I'm not, I'm not surprised. But this is how Belichick does business. He gets rid of players before they're used up, especially veteran players. And he's not into giving guys like Gronk, who have been banged up, that next contract. He hadn't been into it. They're talk, they talk about value, and they have a certain. Um, they have a certain emphasis on a player's age, his overall productivity, and moving forward. So I don't think they're going to give Gronk some huge extension. Now, they do have some money available for right now that they might. So, no, you express you might not want to be here. Shoot, it'd be like, hey, you guys come into Kevin's office and witness them and express like, hey, you know something? Don't know, you know, that getting up early in the morning. Uh, guess what we're going to do? We're going to process y'all. Don't let the door hit you on yeah, the way out. That's the way it is. And Belichick is the best at that, at doing it and getting value for players at the right time. And Belichick's the best at selling early instead of late. Like, there's Belichick sells. Maybe your stock hasn't peaked. Maybe it's like Richard Seymour, where you actually have another couple of years at a very high level. But I'm going to maximize your value. And you can make the argument that Rob Gronkowski, going into year nine, he was mostly healthy last year, but he didn't miss the playoff game, got another concussion the year before. We obviously know they went to the Super Bowl without him. Like, you can make the argument, oh, well, you know what? Now is the time to sell on Gronk. Now, where Gronk had a piece of leverage is they did trade Brandon Cooks. Yeah, who's, All of the, the, who's Danny Amendola is gone. To? Now they didn't know at the time, but Edelman is hurt. Like they, there are things that the there are things the, there are things that you have working in Gronk's favor. But anyone that thinks like I used to that Belichick is not going to get rid of these key players because he wants to maximize Brady's window. Mm -hmm. Belichick's window, he believes is extended past Brady's window. He's not just worried about we got two more years of prime Tom Brady. He's worried about the long haul here. But it does make me look at, at Jenna, that interview that Tom Brady did this summer where they asked him, are you appreciated as a Patriot? And he didn't answer. And this is one of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. You can't appreciate Brady and think about trading Gronk. Amendola's out the door. Edelman's recovering and now suspended. And you were thinking about trading Gronk. You must think Tom Brady can work with anything. But it goes back to the story you told us in the offseason when you went to Israel and you were FaceTiming with Tom Brady, and Tom Brady says to you, can you tell him maybe to get me someone tall to throw the ball to? I mean, he was joking. But, yeah, if you really appreciated your quarterback, you surround him with the weapons that he wants. Belichick does not view it the way we do. Period, point blank. He might view it the way. CC is probably the closest in viewing it the way Belichick does. And by, and I said Edelman injured. Edelman suspended. Thank you for fixing that. The, he doesn't view it as the Patriots window expires when Tom Brady's gone. Therefore, you know what? Even if Brandon Cooks wants a contract extension, we're just going to keep him. Yeah, he believes in Brady. doing good bookkeeping. But, He's going to keep the team and their draft yeah. picks in a great situation. Correct. So even if he was to leave the team, whoever would be next would be in a winning situation situation from the front office. But does he view the Patriots as Tom Brady? No, that's so absolutely not. So that's the not. other difference. That's the difference. Is like, yeah, I, I've said forever, man, you know what the first step of Patriot way is? Get Tom Brady. You know what the second step is? Keep Tom Brady. The third step, make sure Tom Brady's healthy. Man, Belichick, I'm sure, recognizes Tom Brady's the biggest ingredient, but only views him as one of the ingredients. So, like, there are people such as myself that every year in the past seven when the Patriots have spent a top 100 pick on a quarterback. I've said, what are you doing? You, your window to win Super Bowls is right now. It's not how Belichick views things. So, like, Gronk, absolutely. If the right, I want people to understand this. If the right, if the right offer had been made, or if Gronk, we do know that shortly, right around the timeline that evidently the Patriots were shopping him, Gronk, that's when Gronk, remember, three days before the draft, they're shopping him. Two days before the draft, he's like, oh, I'm not retiring. I just want everyone to know I'm coming back. Like, so uh, Gronk maybe got wind of this. The timelines are very, yeah. very important. Right, because he doesn't, well, if Gronk, we can, people can say, oh, it's not fun to play in New England. Gronk doesn't want to play football somewhere else. Gronk wants to keep catching passes from Tom Brady. At least I believe he does. No, at, at least for one more year. Yes. I mean, I believe that one more year, that's what, that's what Gronk wants to do. But also, back to your timeline, Patriots, if they did offer him up, then the next day, Gronk had to make that statement because it takes value out of the trade. 
If they are trying to trade you, you can't be talking about retiring right. because th th no, less teams would be inter interested, uh, interested in your services. And, of course, Gronk wants to keep catching balls from Brady. But Brady wants to keep throwing balls to Gronk because if he's going to have any success this year, he needs somebody to throw the ball to. Well, who he else wants does he have? Exactly. Right. And, and, but Belichick and it's, it's not just care. that he doesn't have anyone. Gronk is a special, special football player. Yeah. That, the Gronk's the only – Gronk is the only tight end in football. Tell me if I'm leaving one out. That you, if you say going into a game, here's who I'm picking, and then you find out their tight end is out for the game, it might make you change your pick. Like I can't yes. think of. He's yes. the, he, Especially with the, the the disparity between who is the next best wide receiver. Yes, there's no team as big as the disparity that we have in New England. All right, let's take a break. Talk Cowboys on the other side. News that'll impact the future of Dak and Zeke in Dallas. Next, first things first. Welcome back to First Things First. Former NFL head coach Eric Mangini joins us. Good to coach. see you, Coach. Good to be Looking here. great today. Thanks. I do what I can with what little I have. <laughs> well, <laughs> way, to, way to start with that bar as low as it could be, Coach. We love having that glass half full with Thank all you. the I see the Fox you. Sports influence on it. it. I see, see how it. That works? I see it. You can't hide the money, Coach. Yep. All right. Well, let's take that look and take it out for a spin. Yep. If Dak Prescott is going to have any success on the Cowboys next season, he better stay healthy and he better stay upright. The only way that's happening is if he's got a wall of an offensive line to protect him. And after yesterday, well, they, they're basically there. The Cowboys and Zach Martin have reportedly finalized a six-year, $84 million extension, which includes $40 million in guarantees, making him the highest-paid guard in NFL history. So, Coach, what do you think? Is this actually the best move for Dak and Zeke's future to make sure you pour all that money into shoring up that line? Well, it's going to have to be. They, they've put a ton of money in this offensive line. There's Four of the five starters are in the top eight on the team in terms of salary cap space. Then they bring in a guy, their draft a guy at number two. So they have committed to this. They better perform at a really high level. Now, they also change offensive line coaches for the second time, I think, now in three years. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And to me, that that's underrated. That The, the effect that that O-line coach has on that group, regardless of how much money you pay him, is underrated. I was with Dante Scarnecchia this, this past weekend, and there's a guy, you talk about force multipliers, mm. he is an incredible force multiplier, and very few of their guys are highest paid in the leagues or number one. Tell, tell everyone who Dante Scarnecchia so is. So Dante Scarnecchia is the offensive line coach for the New England Patriots, who's been there for years. Mm -hmm. He retired, I think, for a season. It didn't go very well. He came back, suddenly it went well again. Yeah. Bill Callahan, who used to be in, in Dallas, who's now in Washington, they moved on from him in Dallas. It went okay. They moved on again. To me, it's great that they have these guys locked up, and, it, and it, it's great that they've got it secured well into the future. But let's see how they come together, and let's see how they collectively pay. Play. This, is, this is why, much to the chagrin of my good friend and co-host, Chris Carter, I talk about money when it comes to the NFL and salary cap a lot. Listen, Tyron Smith earned the contract he got. In fact, I think he earned more than that contract that he got initially from the Dallas Cowboys. Travis Frederick, Tyron Smith, probably the highest paid tackle in football. Travis Frederick earned his way to be the highest paid center in football. He's the Cowboys center. And Zach Martin earned his way to be the highest paid guard in football history. But you do have to ask yourself, is it a long-term tenable situation to have the highest paid tackle, guard, and center in the entire league on one football team in a cap sport. Right now, they're able to do it because they also have the lowest paid starting quarterback in the league. But because he wasn't a first round pick, they don't have a fifth year option on Dak Prescott. This is year three for him. His contract's four years long. You almost never let your quarterback hit free agency. We're talking about this time next year, a new contract for Dak Prescott. I say all that to say this. This puts the Cowboys even more intensely in a, we need to be uber competitive right now we are not in any type of rebuilding we're not in any type of uh, we have a young quarterback we'll take it slow they have spent the resources they have to be and have the talent at least on the offensive line where you would like them to be competing at the top of their division which puts a ton of pressure on Dak and Zeke because the skill position guys elsewhere aren't up to that level I don't know if it does it put a position I think it does the opposite it takes the pressure off Dak I think they're going into this season saying no matter what, our future is Dak Prescott. He's coming off the year he had. Keep him healthy. See what he could do. There's not. They don't have a bevy of receivers to throw to. So let's at least give him a chance and give him some time to do it. I mean, they're trying to do that. But this is 
when you have a system like that, which you said, where the, now their left tackle is the highest paid, their center is the highest paid, Travis Frederick, and now in Martin being the highest paid guard. But it's also their system has worked. They've drafted these players. They drafted them high. They had a high evaluations on them. They have performed at an elite level. The biggest problem is we don't have this model in the NFL. So if they do win a Super Bowl, it would be – well, this is the first time that we've seen this coach, right. this model. Now, this is a copycat. When you say this model. The model where all the bacon is up front. Where right. they where spend all the your money. money is on uh, guys thing, that can't score touchdowns. Every once in a while, Dennis Green used to um, come by practice, and he'd be staring at us and everything. I was like, Coach, what are you looking at? He said, every once in a while, I like to come over here and look in the suburbs compared to <laughs> hanging out in the, in the ghetto. I like to see where my money is. And he'd look at me, Randy. He'd look at our quarterback and say, I like to look at my money. And he'd look us up and down and everything. Right. When you're looking at the money, you're looking at the bacon, it's right there. So now the pressure is on that offensive line because they got no excuses as far as a coach because when you're paid that kind of money, people expect you to self-correct yourself. But it does not alleviate the pressure from Dak and from Zeke that they have to be dominant players. They don't have a lot of playmakers outside of Dak and Zeke. So in the running game, they're going to have to be great. Right. They can't be average. And the thing to watch during the season, everyone is fighting against this. They cannot sustain an injury. With all the money they're spending on that offensive line, that offensive line has got to be able to stay healthy, Coach. And, and here's what I do love about this. I, is I, I love the idea of signing your own players that you've drafted. Of course that you believe in, that you've developed, so that's a great thing. And then if you can if you can pay your best human beings, your best people, that's what I'm assuming they're doing with this group. Yes. That group's going to have to lead because the rest of the locker room is going to look at that group and say, okay, this is where the money is, this is where the investment is. And we talk about the leadership void with Jason Witten leaving and, and even, you know, to some degree, Des Bryant. However you want to however you want to look at that, these guys now have to fill that void. The other thing it means, though, is for Dak Prescott, there is no the, – the Calvary is not coming. We know not this offseason, but next offseason either when it comes to that blue-chip wide receiver. We know how hard it is for a rookie wide receiver to come in and make an instant impact, right? Mm -hmm. That is incredibly rare. They are not going to have – the whomever the Sammy Watkins of next offseason is, the wide receiver that's going to be paid at the top of the market, they're not, they're not going to have the resources to allocate there. So either their own guys are going to have to improve or, as you mentioned – they got to just have not only the best running game in football, but by almost a full standard deviation. Just clearly, no question about it, the most dominant running game in the league. Is that what they're putting their stock into? Is that their thought process here, that this is all going to go through Ezekiel Elliott and he's going to have to carry this team because he's got the line, he's not suspended at all? I mean, we're coming in full force? Well, we always talk about Aaron Rodgers and him not having a good enough offensive line or, or, or Andrew Luck and him not having a good enough offensive line. This is a good enough offensive line. So, <laughs> yeah. so you, they need to run the ball well. If you run the ball well, that takes a lot of pressure off the passing game. But they should have plenty of time to throw the ball as well. And, and maybe they're not getting the blue chip wide receiver. But they've got a bunch of tanks up front that should be able to carry things forward. They should be able to dominate the line of scrimmage. Which I believe the identity is run the ball play action pass so even if they don't have an elite wide receiving core when you have play action pass it allows you more time for the wide receivers not only to get open down the field but you can throw the ball further down the field so that should be how they get the game started when they want to finish out games and score points you got to go to that play action pass All right, so that's something that I find really interesting I want to ask you about because when we think of offensive linemen we think of them helping the quarterback and we think of them helping the running back. We rarely think of a great offensive line can help the wide receivers. For, a, for an under-talented wide receiving core, can you explain a little bit to the audience how a great offensive line, extra time for the quarterback, directly helps them, not just the quarterback staying upright, not just the running back finding holes, but helps the wide receivers? Yeah, when you don't have superior skill, the timing and accuracy of the quarterback, the only thing that's going to help that is give you more time. Like as a defensive back, you can only cover about two and a half seconds. But if you can increase that by another 
third of a second, by half of a second? You're talking about that. That's a large amount of time for inexperienced or guys who aren't used to being dominant. So they don't have to be as consistent, all right, because you do have more time. So also, those offensive linemen with that running game, they draw another guy into the box. So not only do I have more time, there's less people on the field. They change the number count, which gives me an advantage as a wide receiver coach. And any time that you can dominate the, the line of scrimmage in terms of the running game, the, the, you have to add people to the box. You've got to take chances with blitzes. You've got to do things that you wouldn't normally do to try to take care of that, that component of it. So now you have isolated coverage outside. You have very clean reads for the quarterback because he knows what he's going to get. So all those things should help. And on the flip side, defensively, when you've got a dominant defensive line, you can play with corners who aren't as good because you don't have to cover as long. So it affects the, the skill guys in a significant way. All right, Coach, we've got to take a break. Um, stick around. See you right. a little bit later. Coming up, is Lonzo Ball hurting the Lakers' chances of signing LeBron James? Well, a to C. Welcome back to First Things First, NBA champ Steven Jackson in the house. Back with my family. What's up, Steven? What's Good up, to see you, man. So, hey, we've been killing it all week. They own us. Hey, we've been we trending on the internet right now, so let's keep it going. <laughs> okay. Let's keep it going. Okay. We trending. We trending. Right. Let's keep it going. <laughs> it's all about first things first. Air five. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh. So oh. All right, let's do it. Uh, Lakers teammates Lonzo Ball and Kyle Kuzma, they're close friends. And as close friends often do, They've had fun gently teasing each other on social media. But in recent weeks, that gentle teasing has gotten just a hair out of hand. And as a result, in an effort to land the greatest free agent in all the land, the team has reportedly asked the pair of rookies to tone it down. Tone down their social media roasting of each other. The Lakers right now are favorites to sign LeBron this offseason. First of all, Stephen, you know, before we talk about how this impacts the, um, landing LeBron James, mm -hmm. Have you been following the barbs between the two? Do you see the social media roasting that they do to each other? Have you been enjoying it? Or were you like, ah, I'm not into I'm it? I'm an IG. -er. I'm on IG 24 hours a day. So I see everything. <laughs> I everything. I mean, it's they're young kids, you know, and they joke. You know, just imagine if we had IG when we were rookies. They probably would have took it, banned it from the NBA if we would have had it. But these kids are young kids. So you're saying this is just a version of what is happening in locker rooms for a long time. They have just taken it because they're young. Mm -hmm. They've just taken it to social media taking it to public. another level. Oh, yeah. I've, I've seen, especially the young guys, do a lot of things that we have to stop and put an end to because they think it's cool and just being young and not understand that this is not just a game. It's a job as well. But the Lakers doing a great job because it's not, a, it's not a big issue. Nip it in the bud now. Just say you need to be cool with what you say on, on, on social media and just leave it at that. But why, it's not a big deal. Why do you think they needed to nip it in the bud? Well, because you have to show some professionalism at some point. You have to show that you're growing and becoming an adult and, and a professional in this game at some point. And that's, and that's part of and, it. And this is yet to cause an actual issue because these guys are good friends. I know some people with the Lakers, Ramona Shelburne did a good job explaining this. Like, Lonzo in his latest rap, he made the allusion to Kuzma's lack of a relationship with his father. And Kyle father. Kuzma's mom didn't seem to appreciate that much. So that's the closest it's come no, she to. she tweeted out, enough is enough. Right. So because with a bunch of emojis. Like, she wasn't upset. She was just like, but okay, I, did, I didn't even know that in the song. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. The song. Be because the, the thing about it, because it, it says something about her. And right. you don't want her to relive that publicly. And she's not teammates with Lonzo. But you don't do your teammate like that anyway. Well, and I, that, there you go. And so that's kind of my point is that was the closest it came to crossing a line. But the Lakers saw with a number two overall draft pick a couple years ago, social media wrecked that team for the year. Like he snitched, just no, be real. I understand okay, it. D'Angelo Russell with Swaggy <laughs> P, like his the surreptitiously recorded him talking about cheating on Iggy Azalea. Point I'm making is they don't want this to elevate to that level, no matter who they're pursuing. Now, given who they're pursuing, I would say there's added importance they nip this Is there a difference? Like, if they weren't in the hunt for LeBron James, if this wasn't a, a big free agent offseason for the Lakers, would they care as much? Are they just doing this so they can sort of polish the new car and say, look, everything is great and cozy oh. here, and, we, and this isn't a child's playpen? Like, we have the ability to be, like, a mature team? M Magic Johnson is... He's going to do things his way. Now, Magic Johnson, man... He, very, very competitive. My brother was drafted after Magic's uh, rookie year, so playing there with Magic and knowing Magic through the years, yes, he would have nipped this because this is – you have to be able to try to empower your teammates. This is not good to win as a basketball family. It's like – the news that we have or information we have about our family that we joke around around the kitchen table about. 
we man, you go down the street and let someone else say the same exact thing about one of your family members. You're not going to tolerate that. So, you know, it was out of bounds. They're young. They took it a little too far. And you don't know which guys can handle this. Now, right, right. they're saying both of these guys can handle this. Like, if I was with Randy Moss on this kind of stuff, no, he would have laughed in the locker room. But, man, he wouldn't have laughed if it had gotten out publicly. It would have affected him. It would have affected our relationship. And when you get to crunch time, if you have to yell at a guy, if you have to embrace a guy, if you have to give a guy's information a certain way, you don't want that part to be involved. And this is not a part of winning a championship. And if they think these two guys are going to be a part of them when they get it turned around and winning, it's very important that they nip it in the bud right now. Yeah, whether they're doing this for LeBron or not, they need to nip it in the bud because, like he said, it can be certain times where some guys taking stuff more serious than others. And when you're talking about people, parents, you know, somebody can hold that in and like you said, when you got a last shot at him and during the game, he might take it the wrong way and it might cause friction and, and affect the camaraderie of the team. So it's good to nip it in the bud, whether it's for LeBron or not, because you don't want this uh, becoming something bigger coming going forward. And then I think there was something that Kyle tweeted about a, a stack of sunglasses referring to Lonzo's brother, LiAngelo, and what happened. In China. And it, it, it spread further out than just the two well, of them. And it, it hit family members. In my day, if that'll be happening, it'll be blows thrown in the locker room. Like because and neither one of these guys are fighters. Right, neither one of them. They've probably never been in a fight in their life. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time... But you're time, saying that would have been enough to cause a Yeah, cause go, a fight. Go, on, go on, say something about somebody's personal life in a rap. That's rap beef. You know, that stuff really... Mm -hmm. That's real. ...spirals down to yeah. real people getting hurt. So... They got to be careful with that, but at the same time, you got these guys, you know who we talking about. We talking about a, a kid from Chino Hills that's never been in a fight. He probably don't know the things he's saying is offensive, but as you see, if Kyle Kuzma's mom has to speak up, then obviously somebody's offensive. And there are times, I think everyone has done this, where someone says something that actually does bother you mm -hmm. or does offend you or does, dare I say, hurt your feelings, but you keep on a, f a strong face. Like, I don't know how Kyle Kuzma actually feels about the thing that, that his mom responded to. Mm -hmm. right. But I know that publicly, he's not going to be like, well, at least publicly, like, Lonzo, you took it too far. Mm -hmm. We need to, you know. Well, you, Pusha you, T just said the same thing about Drake. And, and the whole world trying to get in between this so it won't, so nobody won't right. get there's hurt. No, so there's no you, Jay Prince in the NBA Right, to end exactly, it. it's exactly. Be Magic Shout out to Jay Prince. Right, right. exactly. And, and I remember, you know, being in a lively locker room there in Philadelphia. And, Jenny, you knew a lot of the players that were there. Man, there was a because I took money from a sports agent and went to Ohio State. So when I signed my contract, man, the running joke was, hey, man, Chris had to take a pay cut to come to the Eagles. <laughs> you know, so there were certain things, and, and that was funny and everything. But, you know, eventually, you know, eventually yeah. and everything, that cost me my eligibility. I was upset about that and everything. Right. So I, did, I wasn't thin-skinned about it, but as my teammates got a chance to know me, they got a chance to also know what makes you tick. And that becomes very, very important when you're trying to build that winning atmosphere. Do you think LeBron James cares about this? Do you think LeBron James would rather come to a team that doesn't have this going on, or does this just not even affect him? You know, him? I, I, I'm, I'm going to say yes, because that's, that's, I think that's one reason why he's running away from Cleveland. The whole Tristan Thomas stuff with all the off-the-court drama they have there. Like, he, LeBron is a straight-up professional that plays basketball that's a private guy. He don't want to be in a locker room worrying about him, somebody showing him how he studied for games or how he prepared for games because you're trying to be funny. He, is, he, he comes to work, and I know that the type of person he is, as big as he is, he don't want to deal with any of that. Look at the last eight years, the amount of things that have been documented about people saying about LeBron and team-building exercises – what he did, what he paid for for the team. And the last eight years, LeBron has played on dominating, veteran, oriented teams. That's they the have key. been almost the oldest teams outside of Miami when San Antonio, they have been one of the oldest teams in the NBA. So the things that they're trying to do for fun, man, what if you bring Chris Paul in there? You think? <laughs> well, there's that, I mean, that's the thing. First of all, there's just the generation gap, which is. Aside from Mario Chalmers and Norris Cole in Miami, who's the young guy that was a key rotation piece in any of these LeBron teams? Kyrie is the one young guy who was very young he when he got there. Though. But Ky yeah. Exactly right. No, that's my point. Kyrie was number one pick of the draft, was, a, was already an all-star caliber player when LeBron got there. He was special. There's a reason Andrew Wiggins got traded. Like, they, he, and before we... 
there were some problems with Kyrie and LeBron as far as how hard LeBron worked, mm -hmm. how much time he was going to commit to playing. So even with Kyrie, mm -hmm. there were some issues because LeBron is – Man, he works so hard. He's such the consummate pro and has set such a high standard. And but the point about like the social media, I LeBron, LeBron doesn't like it when his wife is on Instagram Live or Snapchat Live and shows him. Like LeBron, we for as famous as he is, we don't see much of him. He doesn't want us to see. He controls right. it. You know right. what I mean? And so the, the the and I do think where it affects him and maybe even Paul George is. Man, is this locker room it, a generation younger than us? You know what I mean? Is there, and I'm sure you got to a point with, with the Vikings where at some point the locker room felt like they were into things, whether it was video games or whatever, when you were on your last few years in the league, where it was like, man, I don't have the connective tissue with as many of my teammates as I used to from an off-the-field standpoint. And like this, to me, NBA locker room so much smaller. If it's a bunch of teenagers and LeBron's a grown man, like that, that's, that could be an issue. It's what Tom Brady talks about a lot, where he, he said this in that interview, where he just feels removed, that the, the, the team is mm -hmm. just so much younger than he is. He doesn't understand or he doesn't get all the jokes, whatever. He just shows up and plays. I wonder if that's an issue. Well, people need to understand, too, with LeBron and a lot of guys, me, myself, basketball is what he does. It's not who he is. And, you, and people got to learn how to separate that. You know, one, he's played, He's a basketball player. He's a, he's a basketball player to everybody 24 hours a day. But to him, he's a human being. I have a family. I have a life. So he wants to keep that separate. He does, he's been doing a great job of that, and he wants to continue to.